Okay, well, I'll make that 12 Montana time. So uh, welcome to the Montana Campus Compact 2024 Centering Indigenous Knowledge webinar series. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the penultimate session of the series. Uh, for those of you who haven't met me before, my name is Pete Buchanan. I am the Associate Director here at Montana Campus Compact. Um, I'm also joined here today by Dr. Carla Bird. Uh, she is the Tribal Outreach Specialist at the University of Montana. Uh, she will be our host and moderator today. Um, before we go on, a couple of acknowledgements. Um, Taryn Laskun uh, is our artist who uh, was commissioned to, to generate this lovely background uh, and the artwork that you see associated with the website. So big thank you to Taryn there. Uh, I also want to spend some time and say thank you to our incredibly generous sponsors for the series. So we have Humanities Montana, Reach High Montana, RJS Associates, Clearwater Credit Union, Montana State University, and finally our host institution, the University of Montana. Um, just some final housekeeping pieces here. Uh, please keep your microphones muted throughout the session. We are going to be offering um, Q and A. Uh, it's going to be through the Q and A box uh, at the bottom of the screen there. Uh, however, direct questions will be shared uh, to our host and moderator, Carla. Today, will then be passed through to the presenter. And then finally, uh, please take some time to complete the post webinar survey that will pop up as the as the uh, session finishes, uh, as we really we really value your support and feedback. So without further ado, that's enough from me. I'm going to hand over to our host and moderator, Dr. Carla Bird. Thank you, Pete. Uh, good afternoon and welcome back to our Centering Indigenous Knowledge webinar series. Uh, Montana Campus Compact is excited to return in 2024. This year's series will focus on the theme of Indigenous people in place and will explore people's millennia spanning relationships with and the significance of history, power, and place. Much like the series in 2023, Native languages will, will, which provide the real view to see and understand these relationships will feature prominently in these presentations. Today, our presenter, Aspen Decker, uh, her presentation is titled, Rooted in Language, Upholding Salish Traditions for Generations to Come. Aspen is an enrolled member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes and a speaker of her tribal language. She graduated with a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Montana in 2021, a bachelor's degree in tribal historic preservation from Salish Kootenai College in 2018, and she has a Montana Class 7 Native American Language and Culture Educator License. Her passion for Salish language began as a child learning from her elders who taught her about the importance of perpetuating Salish language and following the seasonal cycles for the continuation of the Salish language and culture. Raising her children in a language as first language Salish speakers has been one of the ways that she honors their teachings. Um, Aspen and Cameron as spouses jointly own Alive and Well a company dedicated to sponsoring Aspen's language revitalization initiatives and cultural preservation endeavors. The company is dedicated to developing and providing genuine indigenous curriculum instruction, contributing to the promotion of diversity within Western education. In her free time, Aspen also enjoys creating Native American ledger art. And if you're interested in any consulting or contracting work um, with Aspen, um, we'll post not only her website for consulting work, but also her website for um, ledger art. And we'll put that in the chat. So I'll hand it over to Aspen. Yeah. Uh, Mutmus <laughs> 
i sahedli through Cameron Decker in Tom through Rebecca Smith Matt in Yaya through Jenny Matt i sahepe through Alvin Bison o chnap chmosom su sihwit o chnostam like sono Lohut sis but some hope Uch in hoi chut is not kate me. Umipanun through a stihutlum stum tamp was tihutlum in wellished in. Util tsil mipanun through in and kadluchts in its hater so web. O yet hua ix. Scum commercial through in in Kadlir Stut and O in in Kadlir Zen Shushuas. Good day, everyone. My name is Aspen Decker. My Indian name is Shining Camus Woman. Um, I'm from the place of the thick trees, and my husband, my husband's name is Cameron Decker. My, mo my mother's name is Rebecca Smith Matt and my grandmother's name is Genevieve Matt. My grandfather's name is Alvin Bison. I am a member of the Confederated Sedlish and Kootenai tribes. So I'm Bitter Sedlish. I am Kalispell Sedlish. I'm also Kootenai and Blackfeet. And Next, um, I said I have seven years, uh, or for seven years, some hope. I've gone to college and I learned about many different languages and the functions of that. Or, in other words, I have a master's in linguistics. And today I'm going to be talking about my language journey and our scaly ways of knowing. Yeah. Uh, rooted in language and holding settlers traditions for generations to come. So even though um, I like to focus a lot on our Kasanka and some Blackfeet ways of knowing, um, you know, being raised here in my community in Arli, a lot of it was very um, you know, sadlish, sadlish stuff that I did and knowing the language, like that's where a lot of my path led was just in sadlish and but I'm wanting to learn Kasanka and Blackfeet next. Pen. Here's an overview of what I'll be talking about. I made this sign when I was introducing who I am. And this is our sign for ourselves, the Beirut Sedlish. And it means the hair that stands on top. And it's the term that we use when we're introducing ourselves to non-community members. It's within ourselves. It's Qedlih. But, um, you know, this sign, it actually even had a misconception. And that's where we hear flathead Indians because they thought our sign was saying we were flatheads. Um, and there's actually been quite a few tribes that were, um, you know, misinterpreted, like the Govant. They thought it was Big Belly, but they were saying the waterfall people. Um, but flathead is really not a term that we even classify ourselves as or pondere, we like to use the terms that we have in our language. Now, so I'm gonna talk about our our in our language, some about my journey. And the primary focus of this is my sedlish or sedlish seasonal round, which is what we do throughout the seasons. And then at the end, I will talk a little bit about academia and then my business. This is a map that I created in my master's. 
And it's the first map that has all of our Salesian language, language, languages within our language family on one map that's more accurate to what we call ourselves or our language. So my dialect here in Montana is in the yellow, the furthest corner, the right corner, in Sedlishtsin, in Sedlishtsin, and then the blue one above that, in it is really close in dialects. And so same with the Spokane. So we got classified as one dialect. So there's 23 different um, dialects within our Salesian language family. And within each of these dialects, there's a few, um, and like for the Colville, there's up to like 10 different bands within that one dialect. And so our and our it's really not much different. I'm fluent in both. And I've noticed maybe 20 words that are different in the nouns, but it's still very tangible. I'm able to understand it. Um, Pinya, ours is in the yellow for this inwards. And along with our in Sedlishtsin, with our language, you could notice the signs that I'm using as I talk. And it's because the our plain sign language is talked along with our language. So our stakat was like our dominant language for the plains. And for a lot of different indigenous tribes, we were able to communicate, do trade. Um, and when we, were, when we weren't um, talking to somebody who didn't know our language, we still use signs. The signs were used no matter what. And it wasn't about the deaf community, or the non-hearing, sorry. And it, it's, it's about just in general, when we talked, it was a way of expressing ourselves along with the language. And our stqalsajt isn't considered linguistically like a complete language. It's called a pidgin language. And so you'll see all of the main points of our stories and what we're talking about. But there's not really like the is and the the and kind of those in between words in the sentence structures. But we're able to communicate. And I actually attended a language conference and there was a, a lady from down in Oklahoma and she saw me signing and we made the same signs to each other and there was no difference. There wasn't really a dialectal difference in our planes sign language. And so, um, you know, we're really close. There's slight differences in dialects, but it's really tangible. We're able to understand each other. And in these pictures, it has my great auntie, Willie in the top, and then my grandma at the bottom right, and then me and my daughter signing. Uh, is our word, and that means hand talk. These are some of the elders that taught me growing up our language. And so the two, the three ladies in the top, they're um, my great aunts. And so the one on the furthest um, left corner, um, she was one of those uh, speakers that was um, a language rememberer. So she didn't really, she wasn't able to really you know, talk and put it out there, but she understood everything. And I actually didn't realize this until I was like 11 or so. I thought it was just her sister, the one next to her that was the fluent speaker. But I told my auntie next to her this whole story for a good 10 minutes. I was going on about all this stuff. And then she didn't have her hearing aid in, so she didn't even hear what I said. And so my other auntie is like, oh, she said, blah, blah, blah. And then she like said everything down to every little detail of what I said. And I was like, like, I didn't even know you were a speaker. And she said, I understand it, but I can't speak it. Like for some reason, you know, I can't come out. And so uh, it was really cool being able to 
still like learn a lot from her and I was like what's this word I'm trying to figure out or like remember and I started saying all these different words and she's like no no that's not it uh, and then finally I said the word and she's like that's it and so yeah we have these language rememberers and then these language speakers and almost everyone here other than two or three or four I guess are, are no longer here um and so the ones on the top and the bottom, other than maybe like the two on the edge, they were my very first, like early, early on language teachers. I was raised like to live and breathe our culture. And so I had a lot of the language growing up, all the basics and getting to hear the prayers and hear them talk. Um, so I was just little, like as young as I could remember back when I was like four, like hearing from Joe Pablo and my aunties and Plesua, who is my teacher in school since I was in Head Start. I still remember things that she told me from when I was in Head Start and kindergarten and all the way through. So I had the language, um, a pretty good grasp of it. And it wasn't until I went to Inclusive Immersion School that it became more fluent. And so having the articulation and knowing a lot of our um, basics and how to communicate and conversate with these elders, my relatives, um, I was able to pick up on the language really fast because of also sign language. Pat Pierre, he's the one with the white shirt. He was my main language teacher that helped me, he pushed me to get getting fluent and so he used signs all the time. And any time I didn't understand him, he used his signs to show me what it was. And then he would explain it in different synonyms. And so that helped me to get fluent within just a couple of months of being there, I was able to stay in the language with him. Um, so I'm really grateful to all these elders here. They had significant impact on my my um, childhood, on my my life surrounding the language and the culture. And Patalik, I guess in all of them, like I really can't even just say one because they've said something to me where I just knew that this is my path that I want to work on our language and our culture and making sure that it's being passed on to the next generation. But um, before I went to Inclusum, there was things that I had to do that led up to, if you wanna learn the language, there's you know all the spirit of the language, there's a lot that goes to it and you need to do these certain things. And so I did those things before I even started at Inclusum and wanted to have that apprenticeship with the elder to get completely fluent and so I was prepared and I was ready to learn um, the language. And I was 13 at the time when I started there. And the things that Patalik shared with me on that first day that I was there, that we needed more of our, our next generation of speakers so our language stays alive. You know, it really shaped my passion too, knowing that I want to go to school. I want to continue on focusing on our language. And so ever since that day, ever since I was a kid, my whole path has been pretty much leading me down the language path of like, what am I going to do to support my language? And when I was that young, 13, um, he and a few other elders, they're like, you need to talk to your kids because our language is going to be saved through the young ones, through the kids. And so I was like, okay, someday when I have kids, I'm going to talk to them. Um, and then I went over to the Kalispell land over in Usk. So they are our sister tribe. And actually they are our Kalispa too, because it, there really wasn't a split until we had the Hellgate Treaty and our treaties that split us up. But there's the lower and the upper Kalispell, and it depends on where you're at in the river. Are you upstream or downstream? But our families are really interconnected. We have relatives on both sides. 
and it's because yeah we were one people and it wasn't just like because of this treaty now you're separate people so anyway um going over there I was able to get this in Qadlis in Welsh and then Qatalik, he is Qadlis and he spoke the Qadlis dialect. So going over there, there was only those few differences. But then Johnny Chwadla uh, here, he is a Beirut Sedlish and same with Susep and some of these other early elders that were Beirut Sedlish dialect. And especially with Susep, Joe Pablo, he had that Bitterroot Sedlish dialect because his grandma walked out of the Bitterroot and she was one of our oldest living elders on a reservation before she passed that had walked out of the Bitterroot Valley. And I got to meet her because she passed away when I was around 10. And she was like 107, but she had all the stories, all that dialect. And now today, a lot of it has merged because we're living together. And as you're speaking both, you know, you just intermix those dialects. And so um, it's important to know what's better said, but it's also very close in dialect. But anyway, going there helped me to understand the language in depth and getting into archival material, the things that, um, you know, our ancestors, our elders had documented about certain aspects. And so once you get to that higher level of their curriculum, you get to learn about all of those archival events and stories. Um, it also helped with my writing and typing skills. And so I was over there when I was 17 until I was 19, and then I moved back home. And I also had other elders like Bertha and Stala and um, these Qadlispa, and she's actually in um Spokane, and Stala is Qadlispa from over there, but they all had influence of the way that I speak, of the way that I look at the language, our worldview. So I'm really grateful for those elders and the elder immersion that we got to have when I was there. Yeah, healing, oh, yeah. In, oh, yeah. So uh, Adelaide Parker, Matt, this is my great grandma. Her name was Adelaide Parker, Matt, and she was one of the last speakers in my family for a while. So um, there was her and then my great aunts, but my great aunts had a different mom. And so that's why they got fluent compared to my grandma and a lot of her other siblings because they were raised by the grandparents of their other mom. Um, but this, oh, yeah, she spoke the language, but she also um, chose not to talk to her kids. And it's a part of that intergenerational, not, uh, not knowledge, intergenerational um, trauma of boarding school. And, you know, they didn't want their kids to go through the same atrocities that they went through. So a lot of our, our elders at that generation chose not to speak to their kids. And so, you know, my grandma, she got to hear her speaking and visiting with all these other elders and with her husband, who is my grandfather. And he went to the boarding school as well as her in mission. And um, he was also like a translator for the BIA. Um, but anyway, so they would talk, but as soon as their kids would come around, it was like they stopped. They didn't want them to be around to listen to it. There's a lot that I could talk about, like why. Um, but anyway, my topia, I never got to meet her because she passed away like two years before I was born. But her knowledge is still being shared through my mom and what I learned from my Yaya and her kids. But now, four generations later, there's the first born bilingual children in our community. My kids um, you know, skipped those generations. I was at the borderline of first language speaker because it's they linguists say 13 and under is kind of that first language speaker. Um, but my kids, they were raised with it from the time they're in my womb of getting to hear me talking in language visiting with elders. And so I'm really happy that, you know, my kids, they're now 
our children's speakers and it, it gives us hope for the continuation of our language. And this is my Sahelawi Cameron, our science, let's say Sahelawi trade husband as well, our sign for a husband. Sahelawi is Cameron. Um, and now this is my son, my family. In Qadlihzen with my children. So keeping them in the language, a lot of people fail with um, staying in their, their target language because when we live in this dominant society, we have to continuously try our best and try to get our kids to stay in that language because they're you know, there's a lot of studies that have been done even with um, Spanish speakers and how those children, um, how, they, how they'll talk language to their, great, their grandparents that are only Spanish speakers, but not to their parents because they know they speak English. And so when I, I've noticed these patterns in my children. And ever since they were little, I have made them talk in the language, but I also want them to have that love for the language. And I recently heard at a conference that um, that we shouldn't be disciplining our kids in our native tongue because it's gonna make them have some kind of um, bad relationship with our language. But if you're raising them in the language, then they need to hear every aspect of it and the ways that we go about our parenting and discipline. Um, so it's important that they get to hear every aspect of our life, but um, making sure that it, it does have that tone of love and, you know, this respect for the language is really important. It shouldn't just be getting after them and saying, you know, bad words in the language, which is where a lot of people are in their fluency, but it's important that they that they get to feel their identity through the language, which is that the sense of being proud and that love for our culture and language. And so for my kids, when they get into English, I always say one of these phrases. Uh, or yeah, this the stem without saying anything. And my kids know that I'm not going to listen to them unless they tell me or ask me in the language. And they, they're just like, oh, damn. And so they'll say it all. Or um, you know, right off the bat, they'll know that I'm just like, OK, I'm not going to listen. So then they'll know right away, like, oh, she's going to check out if I talk in English because, you know, I'll, I'll make sure that they know it has to be in the language. And after a while, they just stay in the language. So it's not being mean, like, oh, I'm not letting them express themselves. They express themselves, but they need to do it in the language and they will, they're fluent enough. They could express themselves through our language and that's what they do. And once they get to around six or so, then they just stay in the language for me for the most part. Um, you know, and then there's always like incentives too, of like, oh, you want phone time, then you gotta, you know, do this certain thing. So we live in these two worlds in this contemporary life. So, you know, you gotta compromise and decide on like, how am I gonna keep them in the language and also letting them be a part of like, you know, having their phones or whatever it is. So I try to make sure that I have majority our language in the culture because they go hand in hand, you have to have both. And so my kids, they're, uh, you know, they get to be on their phones for so long, but then it's like, nope, we need to go outside. We need to go do something Turkish, you know? And so in my place here, we have our dry meat rags. We have like all these different things that really set them up for, here's the culture when we do a lot of drives and we follow the seasons. So it's, it's a continual effort of bringing those together because we need to keep the integrity of the language. Now, so I'm going to get into our Sedlish seasonal round. Um, I'm not going to really explain all of the, the process of our native plants and all these things or what some of the medicinal purposes or whatever it might be, because a lot of things are meant to be within the people. But I'm going to show you a glimpse of just pictures of our seasonal gathering. And there's quite a few cute uh, 
stories that go along with it with my my kids, my sisters. So this is uh some of our um some of our first spring foods and um you know it's important that along with language our language is having our knowledge keepers our elders there with us being able to share stories it goes beyond just harvesting a plant there are a lot of things that are embedded in that in that harvesting and what what we do what we need to know and a lot of times our knowledge is passed through storytelling through oral tradition and so Ipa and you know a lot of these elders that are around us I try to bring my kids to these areas to these places inviting these elders or going to some of these community events where I know these elders are going to be there because they need the time to visit with these elders and get some of that, sorry, that direct um, knowledge transfer. A lot of these elders, you know, they got to experience their elders who they say are, were way more knowledgeable than even them. And we kind of, you know, always say that about our elders because they're the direct descendants of time immemorial, sadly before contact but we keep those stories alive by getting it passed to us as kids throughout our upbringing. Um, yeah, my husband, to share a story, he was asking my daughter about how it was talking to this elder because I took some pictures of her holding hands and talking to this uh, elder and he's like how was that talking to an elder and she's just like normal so it was such an awesome response because that's all she had to say was normal and it's because she's so used to our language and you know it's just a part of it we're visiting you know this is our swedli or camis and um, a part of this, a part of letting my daughter, my children take the lead is important to me because as soon as they get to a certain age, they're getting they're getting prepared throughout our seasons from me and elders telling them how things need to be. And once they get to a certain age, it's time to let them take the lead and just sitting back and kind of being, that mentor, that advisor of like, okay, you're doing it right. Or if, you know, they forget something to let them know, adding in those stories. So you could see my stumjaet, she's getting older and she had to do pretty much everything by herself this past year. And it was good to get to see her. And it makes me realize how much they're listening, how much they're retaining in the way that we've always done it. Our enculturation within our skadli, within our tribe, has always been oral tradition and our culture by practicing and doing and hearing these stories, you know. So it was great to get to see her get to show everything she learned. And I was surprised by just how much she remembered from, you know, every little detail. Um, but yeah, our skadli. There's quite a few cute stories to go along with this. Um, I guess I'll show one other one with my uh, my son when he was only four or five years old, just little. I think he didn't even start kindergarten yet, but we were out there gathering our skhedli and we had only limited petzes, which is our digging, our digging sticks. You can see my daughter digging right there. Um, and so I was like, oh, I actually had them to swelly, go dig up some swelly. And I didn't think he was going to be able to because it is pretty deep. And there's, you know, like we have our pizzas for a reason. And he came back. And by the time I dug out one little bulb, he came back with like five big bulbs in his hand. And I'm like, it's this Chenny. How did you do that? And it's through observation. That's where indigenous knowledge is 
um, compiled too is this trial and error and um, yeah so I don't really want to like share too much about like the best harvesting because that's kind of for our people but I, I guess I'll share because I did put it out there one time but like he looked out in this field and he churned his head and he noticed what was growing higher than the rest and he went out to that spot and he was able to pull it out with his hands and so while I and my daughter and I were sitting in this area that was just full of sweat lee all around us it wasn't the, the earth like it was dry and so we were struggling to get one up and here he came back with all that and so now my kids are just pros at digging it up and it shared it showed me the way and you know he was only four or five so our kids have a lot to offer they share with us they teach us just as much as we teach them sometimes so that was just really nice to want to share that now some more of our our seasons you know being our Sedlish where we're at, we're in between a very plains yet somewhat still connected to our coastal relatives because we paddle, we, we're on the river, we're with these fish, it's a big part of our culture, but so is going to get the buffalo. So I love our culture where we're at, we're situated between both of those and it makes us just that much stronger to be sort of planes, but yet on the water, being with the water. So it's cool. um, you'll see that my he's scraping a willow. And so there's so much that goes into our harvesting and the, the materials, the tools, the belongings that we need in order to harvest. So there's a lot of prep. This is our uh, high tanning. We have it set up about here right now. Actually, a couple of those pictures are from just the other day. We still have it stretched out here, working on our koi koi, our buffalo hides. Um, and it's just, it's important to include our kids. You know, we get into our fast paced lives where we're just like, we need it done right. We need to do it now, you know? And like, so as an adult or as like a person that knows it, you think it might be better just to kind of work through it on your own, but it's important that you include the, the youth, the kids, they need to come and experience it. And, you know, there's tools, tools that I had to make for us to have that traditional sense of belongings there, being able to scrape it with those scrapers, but also using our contemporary scrapers. It's okay to have a cultural adaptation, but for me, it's really integral that I keep our traditional belongings at the forefront of what we do. My baby, youngest one, he's in that uh, hide and it's a, one of our techniques that we used a long time ago for stretching the hide was putting the baby in the middle and it helps to stretch the hide and you have everyone just kind of holding the edges and we bounced him up and down and it was really cute to just see everyone smiling and laughing about how he was giggling like that. Uh, so some again another elder getting to be around our Kasanka elders and um you know all all of my tribal affiliations I want my kids to be familiar with who they are where they come from and so trying to have them exposed to as much of my Kasanka side I was also raised around that and around them so and all, as well as Blackfeet it's like you know, being over there, over the mountains, pretty often growing up, it helped to know that sense of identity. And so my kids, you know, they're getting a lot of our different affiliations and making sure that they know um, certain things that are really integral of who we are. And so I think once I learn the language, once I learn Kasanka, it's going to be a big step to become, you know, bilingual, or they'll be trilingual, we'll be trilingual. Um, but knowing those cool questions as well and a lot of it's very shared because we're in the same location we have the same native plants the languages are different but you know we have uh, pretty much the same a lot of similarities now 
the um, picture in the middle is really cute because it's my Scosa. He's the one that found those Sweli. Both of them, really, they're always figuring something out that I didn't, you know, think about. And they're always being adaptive of like, oh, I bet if we did this, you know, and make it even easier. And it does. And it's what our ancestors have always done. They didn't take the hard way to have to like hike up through all this brush and stuff. You know, we're following the game trails. We're doing the things that are that are going to be sustainable for our people. Um, and so this picture in the middle, my daughter, when she was just little, she got a cut on her finger and it started bleeding. And I told my Skose, who was like four at the time, like, who I said, go get a band-aid because my knees hurt. He saw her blood and then he just ran outside. And I was like, hey, well, what's he doing? You know, kind of thing. And I was like, I guess I'll have to go get that band-aid. And then here he comes running back in and he had our, our sedlish medicine that stops bleeding and prevent prevents infection. And it was just beautiful that, you know, he was listening to what I had to say. I did that to him when he got hurt in the mountains. And so he knew where to go find it. He went and picked it, brought it back in and put it on her wound. Now, just some more pictures. My daughter, um, we were camping and in the corner with the rock, you'll see that she has some pochuyat some of our native Hukuyan, um, and she has chips because there was a Suyapi girl that was at camp and they were trying to um like make a little a little dinner and like playhouse, I guess. And so that little girl went and grabbed chips and then Mani went and picked some plants that she knew taste good, some of her favorite. And so they mixed it together. It was pretty cute to see, you know, just how much that's part of their life, their life ways. Uh, and so along with our seasonal gathering is our baskets, our weaving, and our cedar bark. The cedar for our sedlish, all across sedlish, is really important for us. It's a significant um, natural material that we use for everything. It's like the buffalo, where we use the buffalo for every part of our culture, for our clothing, for our homes. And I could go on and on of the uses. It's the same way for our cedar. And so it's some of our ast that we collected. And our seasons don't just stop when it goes into dormancy. There's things we do in the wintertime and our stories. So I have this teepee um, picture from our teepee out here. And we go in there at least a few times in the winter, try to build a fire and tell stories. So at least they're getting some of that experience that our ancestors would have, you know, with that fire, the flame, and getting that experience in the teepee. And then, you know, certain things could be harvested. We have a lot of mats and things that we need to make in order to be prepared for when all the plants come out. Because when these plants come out, we only have a short amount of time. And a lot of times we have to go around and gather different things because it's all ripe and ready at the same time. So our ancestors, they're sitting there telling stories and they needed to create and be prepared for when it was time to go be busy with picking. Um, as well as the seeds, we do a lot of seed restoration efforts and collection just on our own with our family and you know, doing this, I forget what this process is, but with the seeds and, you know, it's going to ensure that they open and then go and plant them in the ideal locations and make sure that we're restoring our land because it's up to all of us to protect it. This is some images from when I, uh, last spring, I went up to Alaska with my two older kids and we went to an indigenous uh, food sovereignty summit and I presented up there and it was really cool that my daughter it was the first time that she uh, translated for me so getting them to stand up there and start being sorry, these leaders is really important for them to get that early on exposure so when I was a kid I was a miss I was a power princess, Miss Kalispa, and that helped me to talk better or like not be so scared when I'm talking in public. And so I want the same for them. And that's where, you know, having them get up and talk in the language, translate 
it's really cool just to see like how much um, they learn from the next you know event and it's just good for them um but yeah this is some of our some sleep in and we also had some of uh some people from Hawaii that taught us how to do the lays and it was a really beautiful exchange of just indigenous peoples coming together now so it's important that we're taking our children and ourselves back to our ancestral homelands our ancestral sites that we typically harvested and had that relationship with we have all the stories we know the place names of these locations we knew what we were doing in those sites so for us we try to make it out to a lot of these sites and if it's a new site we're going to try to just um, continue on going to those sites, getting familiar with what's around there, what kind of sustenances are there. Um, this is a picture from Missoula right at the university, the M Hill in the back. Um, and my my grandma and my great aunt, they were out there digging bitterroot on the fairgrounds and by the airport when they were kids. Like this isn't a long, long time ago for us our ancestors, the past, the present, you know, um, it's all connected to us. It's all still really relevant. Like a lot of this is from our grandparents, or our, yeah, our grandparents. And so going back to certain sites, Missoula, it's hard because it's so developed, but we try to go to those sites that are untouched still. Okay, you see it's quite so our new place names, we have a lot of place names and sometimes like right behind my place where we're always going, we have a deep connection and relationship with the land around us, especially the ones that we know, like we know exactly what's growing in every little corner of the road or, you know, um, certain streams. So my kids and I, like if there's not a Salish place name already there, then I create a place name using the components and the ways that our ancestors have always created new place names. Things like Eps, it has this. And so there are sites, Eps, Hetch, Eps, whatever, that I um, tell my kids. And sometimes I'm like, what do you want to call this place? And they look around and it's the same thing that our, our ancestors did with ob observing, seeing what's around. If there's like a... a this log and this pond and this water. And I noticed there was already a place name that was like that elsewhere that was like the log that's in the water place. And so they named it that and we're like, or whatever it is. So we, we're descriptive. And if I tell my kids or like whatever this new place name is, they know exactly where it's at. And it's meant for them to know because my harvesting sites are just like a good hunting site. You don't tell people where you hunt. And so my husband, it's kind of funny, uh, he used to just kind of share openly, like, oh, yeah, we go over here. I'm like, no, you don't be sharing those things. And so now, you know, he knows better. And he's just like, oh, I can't tell you. It's somewhere, <laughs> you know, but like, uh, yeah, it's just important that they have um, this ability to keep our culture living because it is a living being and it doesn't just stop with our ancestors it's not like traditional is the only thing that we could look back at we we have to look at it to keep the integrity of the language and of the places but it's a living being and when we find out new things new um new memories in a site you know we need to be able to express that and express where that site's at and so that's what we've been doing and now, uh, yeah, too much time. So it's just I'm getting into my kind of final point before I talk about my business. I will be talking about it. Uh, so I wanted to bring up this cultural iceberg because, you know, we see this a lot and it seems like maybe you, you might see it a little, a lot where it's just like, okay, I've seen this before, but there's so much that really is under that iceberg that people don't see. So getting to see some of what we do throughout the seasons, as you saw in my presentation here, that's just 
some of what we do. It's kind of getting to see that material culture of like what's there, but there's so much that goes beyond that, that, you know, people don't know about. And it's because it's for the people or for our people and for us to know. So a lot of it, you won't see, you won't hear, you won't really know the protocol and how our aspects, how we go about our seasonal plants, our events, our ceremonies, all these things, because you're only seeing this iceberg. So, um, you know, I think it's important that I acknowledge, um, I wanna talk about like why indigenous knowledge um, is important that it's shared through indigenous voices. And so, you know, part of what I've been really noticing throughout my academic journey and just in general, um, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions. And as far as like the way that our indigenous knowledge is disseminated both in academia, in our communities, um, you know, it's important that they know the proper protocols. And so, seeing this glimpse of our seasonal round, the timing, the location, the stories that have been taught for thousands of years since time immemorial, um, it's not meant to be public, as I already said. <laughs> but um, when we say indigenous voices in academia and in general, it means it needs to come from us directly. And I think that gets confused with maybe ignorance or the lack of awareness, kind of the savior mentality, or wanting to benefit from indigenous communities, whether that be getting you know, money or through benefiting or just getting a degree based on our knowledge or our language without bringing it back to the community and giving it, you know, that that ability to be learned in a way that's understandable for our communities. And time and time again, I have noticed that our elders and our ancestors, they've been burnt. You know, our elders talk about, you know, the ones that even came before them, how they got burnt with people, non-natives coming into our community, taking the knowledge that isn't meant to be shared for shared publicly and they profit or they take that without really giving even an acknowledgement to where that knowledge came from. Or also just um, like better yet, asking them permission. Was it okay that they recorded that or that they were gonna share that or write a book about it? And this isn't even just the past, this is an ongoing thing that's still occurring today. And, you know, we need to learn about these things. Some things are hard histories, but if you don't learn about it, then how are we going to better reconciliate? You know, how are you going to reconciliate with the tribes and build that relationship with us, if not starting with respect and cultural humility? But, you know, I wanted to share, I guess, a couple of examples of this, too, because... I've noticed this very recently where, you know, there's examples like non-natives who have been creating language and cultural um, content and curriculum of our Montana native tribes, our indigenous tribes here. And all of the content is coming from the indigenous leaders of those people, from the knowledge keepers, those elder speakers, but yet, um, you know, non-natives are like some people are getting to claim that as part of their language revitalization efforts. And it's wrong because it should be those elders, the ones that have, that are like highly respected in our communities that should be shared. They should be the ones talking on our behalf. Um, because we could talk about it in a deeper level and choose what, what needs to be said. And better yet, it shouldn't have ever been a non-Indigenous person even sharing this or creating this. It should have been Indigenous-led. 
And that's where indigenous voices is really important, indigenous led, um, because it's not the same if you're just getting content or getting information from a tribal person and writing it down and saying, oh, we have indigenous voice. That's not indigenous voice if it's not written by those people or directly cited. Um, yeah, and like another example is going back to in my bachelor's, I took this indigenous film class with a guy who um, actually went on to writing scripts for reservation dogs and he um, he had us watch this clip and it was of this guy who went to Lakota country to Pine Ridge and he um, kind of documented the poverty there and all this stuff. And and then he was on this um, this like news thing where he was crying and bawling about what he saw and had to witness. And he's like saying, you know, he did all this to shed light on their community. But it's like, if you really wanted to do that, you should have brought those tribal leaders that you're talking about. They should have been able to talk about their personal experiences. And, you know, Reservation Dogs, it's such a beautiful series and it hits home for a lot of us because it's written by indigenous writers who were able to portray us in the way that we are. Um, no, and I guess just another example that I want to share, because it's really relevant to this iceberg and our seasonal rounds is there was a non-Native scholar who recently did a dissertation on our medicine dances, our dances that are highly sensitive, that are meant for the people and for us to be there and not to be discussed outside of it. And... Um, you know, it's like, how did how did this IRB get approved when yet there was this Blackfoot man that um, he wrote his IRB to be able to compare our two dances that are very similar and see what the differences are. And he was raised with it and he wasn't going to disseminate it to the public. It was just going to be meant for our two tribes. But then he got turned down and yet this Yuppie didn't. And so... You know, it's just, it's wrong because that IRB for that dissertation, it should have been shut down because that is unethical for us. So it's important that, you know, you're talking to the right people, to the people of our skelly people and making sure that it is okay what you're doing because to them, to a lot of linguists, they think, I shouldn't say linguists, like academics, they think that, um, you know, what they see is what there is. And so thinking that our language is only alive in our ceremonies, when it's not true, it is very strong there, it's talked there. But if you're not a part of the community and you're not living as a member there, you won't get everything, the whole scope of what's going on. Our language, our stories has been oral for thousands of years since time immemorial and Along with that, it's being shared to the next generation. And even though it's not a written public source, it's very much alive through our oral tradition and our culture and our language. And so um, I guess that's kind of my main point is just to really consult with indigenous peoples to make sure that it's okay what you're doing. And sometimes it might get overlooked perhaps with the IRB or whatever it might be. But if you went to the actual leaders of those dances, they would turn that down. And that's one thing that, you know, I just don't ever mention because I know it's not to be shared. Um, and this has been ongoing since the beginning of contact, since first contact. And for us, for Sedlish, it was Lewis and Clark that was our first contact um, Europeans. And they actually took a bitter root from us and Lewis was named the Latin name was named after him but it's just kind of funny to me that like you know it wasn't named after the Salish it was named after this guy that actually got sick from eating too much of our our camises you know he wrote writes about that in his journal um but anyway you know moving forward we love to have indigenous allies that's important it's important to build that relationship 
but the way that you go about doing things, make sure that you're doing it with respect, respect in the proper way, an appropriate way, and having that cultural humility. So anyway, that's what I want to say about this um, iceberg. Oh, I know we're down to the last minute. So anyway, this is my um, linguistics thesis. I don't really talk about it. Um, this is just some of the uh, worksheets that my daughter, um, that she like, wrote out. And it was interesting through my master's, like being able to really identify all the rules to the language. So um, this is my business, LLC. And for the things that I just talked about, the seasonal round is at the heart of what I do with my culture and language. And being able to have that Salish voice in our ancestral homelands is why we started this business to be able to share this knowledge in an appropriate way and the things that are, aren't are culturally sensitive, that are culturally appropriate for me to be sharing. And then within our own tribal communities, you know, we monitor what we are. We know what we're putting out there that's for our tribal members here, our Skelu here versus when it's non-member. And I've had thousands, thousands, hundreds of, you know, hours, I guess, of um, talking to my elders and my husband about what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And so, you know, we came down to all these conclusions of like what could be shared, what can't be shared. And there's a certain border, like a line that you shouldn't cross. And this is my art. And I, um, I do a lot of art, too, as a way of sharing culture and history and language. And if you want to check that out, uh, I have a lot of like Salish historical events that I'll be doing. So no, no, yeah. Thank you all. Thank you, Aspen. Um, I just wanted to read. I know some people might have to leave, um, but I did want to read a few comments. Um, Garth said he was very inspired by your commitment to preserve your your language through your children. Um, um, another, Callie said, um, this was absolutely incredible. Rose said, you're a great leader and true inspiration. And then um, someone mentioned that, thank you so much for sharing your perspective on exploitive research practices. It's so important for non-Indigenous researchers to hear this. I am dismayed to hear that extractive research practices continue. Um, a few questions about um, some of your content, sharing content. And then one last question, Aspen, if you could answer before you leave. Um, is there an, a tactic that you use when shaving the cedar bark to make sure the tree isn't harmed or heals? Yes. All of our culture is about sustainability, never harming our plants and making sure that everything that we do doesn't harm whatever it is. So for instance, that ost, that cedar, we never cut more than, there's like certain knowledge that goes behind it. And we never cut more than what we know is appropriate, what is okay for that tree. And it heals and all the sites that I've harvested from, we go back all the time and we look at it and we see that that tree is still flourishing and it's still alive. And it's because our ancestors knew exactly what they were doing in order not to harm that tree. And it, it's a beautiful thing. Some people are like, you shouldn't cut where people see, but I'm like, that's a part of our culture and it's a beautiful thing. And, you know, it's a living culture. Um, and yeah, there's actually research done. If you wanted to look into it, Dean Nikolai is one of our CSKT members and he actually did a uh, master's thesis on our culturally modified trees, which are these cedar bark basket uh, trees. Thank you, Aspen. Thank you so much, Aspen, um, for sharing all of this with us today. Um, and please, everyone, please remember, come back next Thursday. We will actually have some of our students from our tribal colleges presenting. Um, so thanks again. Pete, any last comments? Yeah, thanks, Carla and Aspen. That was that was incredible. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to everybody who attended today's session. Um, and, you know, it was wonderful to hear about your experiences there, Aspen. Um, we really value you taking the time to be with us today. And one thing I would uh, ask you to do is if you get the chance, please complete our uh, post session survey. Uh, and if you miss part of today's session, or if you'd like to share it, we'll also be uploading the video to the Montana Campus Compact YouTube channel. Uh, with that, I think that's everything. Thank you so much to everybody for being here today, and uh, we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.